Perfect. So welcome everyone. Um, episode number 61 and a bit of a, if you tuned in to see Tibi Ailis posterior, that, uh, that one has been postponed till, uh, till December. And we got a massive thank you to say to Nina from uh, Word Prescription, who not only agreed to get up at 5am to do this, <laughs> but, but, but uh, which is always awesome, but did so with four or five days notice when we were scrambling around. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And, um, no and we're really looking forward, we're, we're really looking forward to this episode because it's the third of this kind of theme. Uh, episode number 13 with Jill Woods was about uh, social media and marketing and episode number 42 was about video content and, and video marketing and we had a panel um panel there as well so this is kind of the third in the set and we, we like that because it kind of build on few, on on past episodes so we're talking about content which is, is nina's specialty and and um you know websites blogs newsletters a bit of rules and regs social media will uh, undoubtedly come up so um if you've got any questions um about your own content about your own website while you're watching just fire them into the comments and craig will um, keep an eye on them as well but we'll kick off with a really basic and a really broad question about about content in general if that's okay nina and just yeah could, could you just let us know a couple of things firstly what what does it, when we say the word content, you know, and um, we're talking about health professionals, you know, podiatrists, et cetera. Um, what, what do we mean when we say, you know, having good content or bad content? What is, what, what is content? Yeah. Well, first of all, content is not just words or the written material you produce or your digital content. It's everything. So um, it's everything, essentially, your perspective patient can see, uh, whether it's digital in print, whether it's video, um, so it's just any way that you're using to communicate with them, really. Perfect. And, and, and you know, in your position as someone who yeah. sees, sees more content than, than anyone, I'm sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> are there, you know, we're going to come on to the nuances of what content should potentially look like, depending on what your, your goals are or your demographic, uh, you know, mm -hmm. target market, et cetera. But are there any real hard and fast rules about things that are considered good content? So regardless of all your your own sort of um, nuances, things you should definitely be doing. And likewise, do you ever see things and say, this is a, a big no-no, this is bad mm. content, regard regardless of what your goal is? Any, any examples? Um, is, is it that simple? Yeah, I think um, if we are looking at, I was going to say website content, but really it applies to video all the same. Um, anything that doesn't make it easy for your uh, reader or your prospective patient to absorb the information. Um, so anything that uh, waffles isn't clear enough, um, doesn't, you know, every piece of content should have a message. You're like, all right, this is, this is content, whatever platform it is. Uh, and this is the goal of the content. And it should really achieve that as easily and simply as possible. And it should be easy to, to know what the next step is. Um, and make that next step really easy. So whether it's conversion to have a really, you know, quick book button, whether you want to direct someone to a landing page and then you've got that set up and optimized for them to easily get through to, whether you're giving them something, whatever it is, um, I guess the good content does that as easily and simply and as quickly as possible because you don't, whenever you're engaging someone, uh, whether it's print, online, video, um, it's you only have so much time with them before they'll if they don't find the information they need you know that's it you kind of you've lost them um, because you can have some nuggets of gold in there which is exactly what they need but if it's so far down in a massive chunk of text that no one wants to read it's going to do nothing for you so I guess um, that that is the kind of goal golden rule, quick, easy, simple, and straight to the point, as specific as possible, and as easy for them to interact with and take that next step. So when I, when I think about that in content, I always think about the user experience as well. So however they're absorbing that information, how easy is it there for them to see, you know, what that next step is and access it? Do you have a really big obvious button for your call now or do you, you know, kind of hide it and make them have to kind of search for other content that they might be looking for related to what they've just read or, um, yeah. So I'd say bad content is vague. It's, uh, it's, it's way too long. It doesn't give enough of the right information as, as easy as possible. Um, and it just doesn't add value. Yeah. Actually, just, just just on that, Nina, I've, I've seen probably a couple of bits of research now that have looked at the Google search rankings, mm. and 
you know, they try and analyze and reverse engineer what ranks well and what doesn't. Typically what ranks well is 3000 or so words, which mm -hmm. is to me is too much for what you're saying. Okay. Uh, well, I, I think it, it's what, like, was it that in healthcare? Uh, no, generically. Generically, yeah. I mean, I think it's got to be for the purpose that you've got to, like, if you think of, so in, in podiatry, um, if you think of what people are mainly using Google Ads for, uh, which is either to find someone ASAP or to find more about why they're experiencing the pain that they're experiencing and to learn a bit more about that and what they should actually do about it. Um, that it, if it's the, if you're in the first case, really what someone needs to know as quickly as possible is that there is someone in their area that actually treats the problem that they have. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, give them that confidence that, yep, this is the right place to book in with. And that I, I probably would disagree with that. Uh, I think that needs to be done as easily as possible because they have an immediate concern. They just need someone to fix it. Um, whereas I think if they want to look at, you know, if they started getting a niggle in their heel or in their knee and they want to learn a bit more about what it could be and they're, they're more interested in, in maybe some self, you know, home self care tips before they're ready to see a professional, um, then, you know, having a bit more information, uh, is great, but I'd say 3000 words is definitely more than what I would recommend for sure. I, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. People don't have time to read the 3000 to get to the information they want, yeah. but that, but Google wants lots of good content. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's about, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. I, <laughs> um, on that note, uh, we're going to come on to blogs a bit more. Uh, uh, I'm sure in, the, in, 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 um, a few questions time, but one way I was speaking to someone, they said one way around this is, you know, that, that uh, Google likes to see lots of words and lots of keywords. And it also likes to see your website growing. I think it, it favors websites that look like they've got growth. So they said the reason you should have your blog attached to your website is you can keep your, your landing page, you know, your, your certain pages mm. kind of like you say, snappy and, and to the point, and then you, you can allow to backdoor your way into the Google optimization by publishing regular blogs, which are bigger, wordier. They've got the keywords in them. Is that, um, is that your, is that an accurate understanding of the state? Yeah. Of I think if we just take a step back and kind of understand how Google works, it's that if you think of what the point of Google is, it's to connect someone searching for a particular phrase or the, the keywords they've used with the most relevant information to them um, for the area that, that they're at. So um, I think, first of all, when you, when you publish your blog, you've got to make it really clear to Google what that page is about. So that's why you do, you know, people talk about like meta titles and tags and, and keywords because you really want to make it as easy as possible for Google to read your page and be like, yep, like I can categorize it. I can, um, you know, classify it as this. I can present this information to people searching for this. And the easier and the clearer that you make that with your keywords and the information that you put in there, um, especially in your headings, um, then, then the better and the easier you're making it for yourself to be found. But then once you've got people on that page, you want to provide them with genuine, useful information. And again, so say then you, you write kind of like a thousand words about um, a certain condition paired with a certain treatment that you offer or whatever else it is, just, just describing, you know, how, how someone can kind of, kind of do something or just teaching, um, teaching someone about, about a topic. Um, then having that be really, um, you know, valuable, good, genuine information keeps people on the page for longer. And of course, Google loves that because Google wants, you know, wants people to, to find that really good, useful information for them. So yeah, they, they measure, that's why you measure your bounce rate or the, the, the link that someone stays on your page. And then that will give you more authority and that'll help direct more people there. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a bit of both. It's the, yeah. Perfect. And just an, an add on to the good content, bad content question mm. uh, before, before I forget. Um, and we may well have touched on this, but what, the, the type of language we use, you know, this kind of very uh, approachable lay language versus the more professional language, medical terminologies. We're in a different, difficult space, I think, aren't we? Because we're, we, we don't want to bamboozle people and, and terrify them and, and we want them to understand what we're saying. But at the same time, I know I've definitely been guilty of, of 
writing things probably more complex than I should uh, mm. because because I'm a medical professional because yeah. I want people to know know I'm a medical professional and and someone sort of said to me you know, think of when you look for other services whether it be a builder or a somewhere to take your car for a service like I, I don't know anything about building or about cars so mm. the website that, that will speak best to me probably isn't the one that throws a load of jargon in my face yeah I'm probably doing that to to people looking at my site um where do you land on the kind of type of language do we go super lay do we go super medical professional or do we do we try and tread some kind of line yeah it's it's definitely treading a line uh, probably what i like to stick with um because any any project that i work work on with a client we do define you know the tone and the voice that we're using um, and my voice of preference is very much like you're having a conversation with a patient in your clinic you know it's very um you know, it's very kind of organic and uh and genuine and it's you're just having a direct conversation obviously you wouldn't be using you know super technical medical language in a conversation without explaining to them what they actually you know what it actually means i know when i was a podiatrist um i'd use a stack of analogies for everything to help people you know understand it as easily as possible and apply it to kind of their everyday lives and um i think it's exactly the same and so when it comes to something a bit more technical say you use the word so i'd probably you know if you say the word patella just in brackets right you know um just kneecap or um or vice versa uh, make it a little bit easier but yeah you definitely uh keep that engagement higher by using simple language for sure yeah perfect um no questions have come in about content in general have they quite no, not yet. We... No, i think people are the, okay, the people perfect. watching just taking it all in <laughs> Perfect. So we'll we'll move on to we'll, we'll sort of bunch things into little areas. Although I'm, they obviously all will converge and overlap when we're talking about websites and blogs and newsletters. But we'll sort of just partition them if that's okay for for ease of discussion. And um, and we'll go to the website first, just because it feels like it's the you know the the hub, doesn't it? The epicenter of our our online presence. Everything they say should point back to your to your website, and it mm -hmm. should represent you and be your brand and things. So um. A few website questions that people sent me in um, in, the, in the last couple of days, and, and the, the first one was about the home page, because I think it's I think it's fair to say it's probably the most visited page of most people's websites. It's where mm. you know people land. What 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 should a home page look like? Are you a big fan of it just being like a like a nice sort of placemat with then clickable links elsewhere, or, or or do you think there should be as soon as someone lands, they should know? who I am and where I work and what I do, uh, you know, what, what does a good homepage and a bad homepage look like content yeah. wise? I think there are a few different elements here. I think um, one of the things that people probably overlook the most is that um, certain clinics have really direct benefits to their patients. So some of them are open seven days a week. Some of them are open, you know, late nights. Um, some of them, you know, have certain actual features um, or, or kind of, you know, things like that, that are direct benefits to the patient that they should start displaying at the very top. So for someone, you know, who has kids, who needs to be a bit, you know, might need to get kids in before school to actually, you know, have that you're open early mornings, you know, at the very um at the very start of it and just like emphasize those benefits, even in your header is absolutely key. Um, I think that really when someone comes onto your website, it's, uh, it's often going to be either a person, that's what I mentioned before, it's either a person that has a problem that's searching for an answer or it's someone that, um, well, yeah, I mean, they, or they're just get, getting more information about the services that you offer. But it's being able to assure them that they're in the right place and that you can help them as, as quickly as possible. So probably what I see kind of going wrong on that other end is that um, someone will have a website and it'll be a beautiful website and then it'll start off, you know, start off with this long paragraph about how they started back in 92 and, um, you know, how, how, kind of how the journey's been for them and, and all that kind of stuff. And it's really all about them, but really, you think like when, when you visit, visit a website, you want to know kind of that you, you want to find the information you're looking for as quickly as possible, just to make sure that you're in the right place before you're confident enough to just kind of spend more of your time reading through it. Right. So being able to, to do that. Um, so I, 
a lot of clients that I work with, we do emphasize their services really early on before we kind of get into any like meaty paragraphs um, or, you know, conditions that they, they often treat. They can choose kind of four to eight conditions to emphasize just for those people that they are really targeting. So that when they see that, say that someone comes in with, with heel pain or shin pain or whatever it is, even kids, parents come on, they're like, oh, you know, like, is this, you know, should I be bringing my child here? Um, and so straight off the bat being, you know, having, um, you know, kids podiatry, uh, as one of the first things people see as they kind of scroll down past your banner is, is great because then people will be like, okay, cool. I've, I've had that mental tick, you know, they, they definitely offer what I'm looking for and then they're, they're going to keep reading. Um, so that's, that's a massive benefit. If also, um, in terms of whether having stacks of the content on the homepage or directing to people to other pages. So I'd say I use the homepage or I encourage my clients to use the homepage as an overview and, and to link to other pages. Again, it's going back to what I mentioned before for Google. So say you have information about so many different conditions or services and you do a paragraph on each all on the homepage. When Google actually goes back and reads that, um, they're like, all right, cool. What do I, you know, it, it won't rank in like those, all those treatments that you have on there. Um, so you see, so you mentioned kind of four treatments or four problems. Google won't know which one to, to focus on. So that when someone types in, you know, heel pain and then a, a location, you won't be directed for heel pain. You may be more, you know, if you've optimized all your headings and, and all your tags and everything to be, you know, podiatrist in this location and someone types in podiatrist, then yep, you can rank that. But if you're spending time putting all this content and all this information about certain conditions you, and you want to, you know, take advantage of the free service that Google offers to actually, you know, help people find you. And if you're not kind of giving everything its own page in order to optimize that but I think that you are doing yourself a disservice um, so my my tip there is definitely you know have a have a, a link from your home page onto dedicated pages for particular conditions for particular services and and understand why you're doing it it's, they don't have to be massive pages but you, you know that when people look for you know Achilles pain or whatever else in your area then kind of if you've done it right, the, the chance of you actually, you know, Google showing that person your page and directing them to you is, is significantly higher. And um, given that it's a free search tool, I'm sort of like, why wouldn't you maximize that? Yeah. Is there, talking about pages, is there mm -hmm. an optimum number of pages for a website to be you know a bit like when someone says a cv should always be x amount of pages because mm. it shouldn't be too too short or too long you know like the goldilocks principle i guess um is there a, is there is there an optimum number of pages and i also recall being told many years ago by someone and it may not be true that no page should ever be more than two clicks away from your home page and i don't know whether that's some kind of urban myth but i mean because you know people don't want to get lost in like a, a a maze so to speak um so there's probably two questions there optimum number of pages if there is and and should we always only be one click away from our home page um i think that i guess to answer that it's it's not all about the home page so all of your landing pages may not link from your home page and a lot of people aren't finding your landing pages just through your website or google as well like you're you're directing people to specific landing pages from social media from google ads from you know other things that you're putting out um so i think that that's probably less that's probably less important. Like when I, like, I guess you got to think about what percentage of your patients will go first actually onto your homepage. Um, and usually that will happen when they're just searching for a podiatrist in the area. When people are searching for specific problems or specific treatments that they've heard of or whatever else they've been referred to by, by a physio or someone else and that they're, they're looking for, you know, they've got your name and then they type in the kind of the problem they're having. They're actually probably going to be more directed to your landing page so that's your specific service or condition page or whatever else your page is first. So I don't think, like, I think I'm all for ease of accessibility, um, but I, I don't think that should be a sort of cardinal, cardinal rule there. Um, and for the number of pages, I mean, I've 
done websites that are five pages long and I've done websites that are over a hundred pages long. Um, wow. And uh, the pages that, that are, are on the higher end is because we just pack them with standalone pages on a stack of conditions, a stack of um, services. And um, like ultimately they drive more traffic, right? Because th they have all those landing pages. So then when, when people search for specific conditions or just pains, you know, they're experiencing toe pain, forefoot pain, you know, whatever, we've optimized it to help them find them. So those people will be getting more traffic. I mean, if you, if you talk about three, three conditions, um, then you're just helping people find those three. If you talk about 50 conditions, then you're helping, you know, people find all those. And it is a snowball effect. So obviously the more visitors you get, the, you know, the more authority you'll build, the easier your page will be, you know, shown to other people. Um, so I think that for, yeah, I guess it depends on the size of your clinic and what, what your target is, but I don't think there's a minimum or a maximum number of pages. Um, but I think that, if you do have only a few pages, you just got to understand, like go through the patient experience from start to finish and just, just start with your homepage, read everything back. Think about, you know, your, your target market and the patients that you see, see most and just say, you know, how easy is it for, you know, patient X that has this problem to find the information looking for on my website? Is there enough information there? Is it easy for them to know that they're actually in the right place and to know that you can help them with that? And then is it easy for them to book an appointment or know what the next step to do is? Perfect. I hope you charge the client with a hundred page website per page, did you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I actually have a, I have a little, uh, I have a little package on uh, conditions and um, they're obviously changed for everyone, but um, we do, we <laughs> do like, you don't have yeah. to answer that. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, last, last website question. Um, yeah. And it's about the, the, the biography or the about me page, because um, I know that most people, you know, they get to a website and like you say, is this, is this the service I'm looking for? You know, I want to find mm -hmm. the information quickly. And then if it is, the next step a lot of people will take is right who is this cat you know what what's their deal i want to see a picture of them i want to, I want to check they don't they don't look uh, terrifying whatever it may be and, and we now know that you know um people get far more engagement on on any online content if they have a photo of themselves or, or mm -hmm. at least at some kind of avatar rather than you know the twitter egg or something so uh, on a biography on a website i've seen two kind of distinct styles when i've look, looked around websites and things and and one is where they write a very professional biography in the third person mm. a bit like you know uh ian graduated from this university he's got this degree and he published in this journal um and, and then the other is where it seems a lot more laid back relaxed approachable chatty and it's written in the in, in the first person and it's yeah. like i like you know walking my dog in the countryside blah, blah, blah. you know um what do you think i mean there's probably no right or wrong like like with a lot of these questions but what do you advise people to mm. to lean toward most of the time what do you think gives the right message to the people that are looking for our services yeah um i would say that i would say to either write it in the first person but a lot of a lot of people aren't kind of comfortable with that style of writing when, when talking about themselves well that i've worked with anyway um but i would say like, so what i wouldn't do is i wouldn't say you know ian graduated in you know 19 blah 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 from university x no one really cares too much about the university you graduated from um, but they do want to know, you know, your experience. So um, I, I wonder if I can find a reference to this, but the, the way that a lot of content is studied and what I, I learn a lot about is, is heat maps. So it's, um, they study people when they open a website, kind of where their eyes go and the amount of time they spend on a, se a section of the page and, that, and they do it with heat maps. Um, and I think one of the most common, I'm not sure if it's, health professionals specifically or just kind of professional industries. But I believe that, that one of the common places your eyes can dance to first is actually just, just a summary of your, um, kind of any additional qualifications or something like that. Not for, I think it's, it's one of the first places that it goes to, but not for too long. I think the first thing that someone uh, wants to know is just that their, their practitioner is, is kind of knowledgeable and um, trustworthy and experienced. And then they'll kind of, keep reading on from that um i wouldn't make it too technical about you you know d achieve this diploma in in year xyz um but if you start off um whether you say i or whether you say you know if i said you know nina um 
you know, has been a, a podiatrist for over 10 years. She's been, um, you know, she, she often oh, says, you know, has a, a special interest in treating, you know, these conditions. You know, she's worked with, um, you know, the Oxfam team to, to do X, Y, Z, or she's, you know, j- just make it a bit more, um, a bit more, definitely a bit more personable, but still relevant to what people are, are, are searching for. So um, I get most of my clients to finish the information off with something a bit personal, um, just so, you know, to help that relatability. But I think the most important thing for people is just to know that they can, can trust you um, and that you, you know, you, you do have the right kind of knowledge and um, yeah, yeah, to, to the, that's kind of one of the, the decisions, one of the key um kind of influencing factors for their decision making um, and then for your photos like definitely have a photo of yourself but also please have a foot depending on how big your team is please have a photo of your team um, I think that your website just generally is a great way to show your team culture um, and that's something that you know a lot of people clinics have a great culture but their website just doesn't get that across at all so you know show what kind of a team you are and um i have recently started adding a lot of videos on a clinic's values um onto their team pages as well and actually onto their home page for that matter because they're, they're getting a bit more like sharing you know those values and and kind of what they um what they stand for and um that's been great that's uh yeah it's, it's definitely reduced kind of the it's increased the time that people stay on that page and that the video engagement there um but yeah don't don't make it too technical don't overemphasize which qualification you received at which university um but do you know do talk about the the areas that you're that you're interested in and the things you know that you know if you've worked with organizations or other groups or whatever else definitely chat about that but um just at the end of it read it back and just say you know have i kind of shared enough to show that um i'm i'm relatively knowledgeable and um that people can you know that that i i'll have a good relationship with my client with my patients and um yeah perfect just squiggling a note to myself that my website needs a full <laughs> overhaul uh, right yeah I, i've actually just been checking out my wife's website as you were talking actually just, just back just backing up a little bit nina i'm yeah. just talking about um keywords and homepage. i why why you were talking then I was, i've just done a couple of searches here mm. this is a keyword tool that i use yep. so i've just done a search here for podiatrist melbourne yep. and it's telling me in australia there are 1600 searches for that term um per month so yep. i just self melbourne but i just job so that would be your home page but i've just done this one here search for heel pain melbourne and it's telling me there are like 10 searches a month for that so that would be your landing page that you would target that keyword um but i just noticed this one here i, I typed in plantar fasciitis melbourne mm. restricted it to australia and it's telling me there's 10 searches a month for for that word yep for those words but i just this one here caught my eye too shockwave therapy plantar fasciitis melbourne mm. now, there's only 10 but that's an, that's that would represent an opportunity for a landing page for someone who's got shockwave yeah, yeah that, that seems quite low actually um yeah. well I've, I've, I've restricted it to australia and it's yeah, only yeah. google but i've got actually let me let me just I wonder let me just try youtube while you're there <laughs> um but this is the tool that I, I, I tend to use um, yeah, because it gives you trends and how competitive that term is. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Oh, okay. There's 30 searches a month on YouTube for that, which is interesting. Yeah. Plantar fasciitis Melbourne. But, yeah. And that, 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 I think that's actually quite high that people are actually using YouTube to look for that. <laughs> yeah. 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 That is. Yeah. So, but that's, that's the point you were trying to make about landing pages and, and, and opportunities and those kinds of issues. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And, and yeah, your, your keyword research is definitely quite important there. So, mm. so using tools like that and using the, um, the Google ad kind of keyword search tool, um, is, is great for that. And, um, I guess the, the other, the other way that I do it is, is just to, to take the questions that you get from your patients that do come in because usually, you know, quite often they'll come in and they'll have a stack of questions for you. And it's, it's often the same questions that they've searched online that they're, they're like, right now I want you know, your podiatrist's opinion and not just Google's opinion. Um, and, and definitely optimize pages for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I just, I'm just doing a quick search. I'll just show you something in a moment. Uh, yeah. oh, um, while you're doing that, Craig, let's, let's 
talk about blogs if we can, Nina. Sure. Um, which I guess, I guess they're kind of talking about them separately to a website, but I know that mm-hmm. the majority of people, their, their blog is you know, part of their website now, but we'll kind of separate them a bit because it seems to be the thing that, you know, people are, are sort of doing regularly. You do your website, you spend months and months and months getting it right yeah. and it goes live and then you just kind of don't tend to look at it for a long, long time. Whereas your blog is something you give attention to. Well, yeah. f- first question, how frequently should we be writing blogs uh, once a week? Should we be doing it once a month? Is there a sweet spot? Is it is it once again completely dependent and, and not just the frequency, but what... What, what sort of ideas um, do you often sort of um, put forward for, for, for blogs? Is it, um, is it again, kind of a personal thing? I mean, I, I, I don't tend to write blogs about patients myself. I tend to write mm. them about kind of um, areas of in- interest, so to speak. And, and I know other people would write the sort of almost case studies. Should blogs mm-hmm. have academic references in them? I mean, what, what are mm-hmm. some of the blog, uh, some of the gems you've got about blogs for us? Um, in terms of what your blog should be about, so blogs, are, they're blogs, but they're also landing pages, right? So um, actually one of the questions I get is, should conditions be condition pages or should I write blogs about them? Um, and I think uh, either one of those, either one of those is fine. Usually if you have them as conditions on your website, they're just a bit easier to access and find for patients that are going through your homepage. Um, but I, so, so I guess the first thing is when you're writing blogs, um, don't just write blogs for the sake of them. Um, write blogs because you have a plan and you know kind of what the, the goal around that is. Um, so what I mean by that is, um, you can look at it a number of ways. So you can, uh, if you're not sure where to start writing a blog, um, I'd say do what I said before, and that is take the kind of five or three most common questions that you get asked by new patients in the clinic and answer them, right? Because if a lot of people are asking you that in clinic, 100% they're thinking about it and they're searching for it online. So give them the answer. Um, Then you can write blogs on relevant, you know, events and things coming up. So if you have a running event happening in your city, um, give them, you know, five five ways to help, you know, prepare for your running event kind of in the the months leading up to it. So you can do, um, and and definitely like you can backlink from your blog to the event and um, and, and encourage engagement from there because then when you share on social media, you can tag the event and then they can kind of tag you back and you can kind of get more engagement that way. So um, again, the goal of a blog, it's to, to help people get the information they need to make a booking decision for most clinics, right? You do it because you want to see a return on your investment. Um, so help people find the information that, that they're looking for the most. Um, again, that, that keyword search tool that you just showed before, Craig, if you see that a lot of people are searching, you know, plantar, uh, shockwave treatment for plantar fasciitis in Melbourne, write a blog about how shock, if you offer shockwave, write a blog about how shockwave helps treat, you know, can help in the treatment of, of plantar fasciitis because you have to stay within ARPA regulations here in Australia. Um, but, you know, write about that. So answer, use those keyword search tools. Um, there's another one you know, that mentioned um uh, before for this podcast called uh, Answer the Public um, that Ian, Ian uh, sent through to me. So uh, Answer the Public is, uh, it's like a keyword search tool, but it's, I think it's just answerthepublic.com um, if I'm correct, but it comes up in longer phrases. So it has a lot more questions around particular search terms. So you can, you can look that up and it just presents it quite nicely, although you can just download it as an Excel spreadsheet too. Um, but look at all those questions that are often being asked online and answer them is a, is a great way to start. Um, and then if like, look at your marketing plan. So if you like in Australia here next month, October, mid-ish October is foot health month or foot health week. Um, so, you know, prepare for that. So write blogs on, on, you know, tips like look after your feet or, you know, whatever it may be that you can promote during foot health week. Um, yeah, and, and just answer, answer questions people have. And if you don't have certain landing pages, like you, you look through a database and you're like, all right, like I don't have anything on in towing and kids, then, you know, write a blog called, you know, is, is, in, you know, what should I do if my kids are in towing or, you know, is, is in towing normal and, and just, just chat about it from, from your experience and, um, do like, I, I definitely try to reference it 
I guess there's a difference between a blog and an article. Um, and there's a difference between saying, you know, in our experience in the clinic, kind of X is normal or, or making statements that actually, you know, that, that definitely need uh, evidence. So if you're like, all right, like 37% of people will into at some point, your kids will into at some point in their lives, then yeah, the, you're going to, you're going to need to, to back that up. Um, but yeah, it, it depends whether you, you speak from, from your experience or from if you're making facts and claims that you need to substantiate. Sure. Okay. Here, here's another example. I've just mm. again, doing this search while you were talking. Um, yeah. Let me just share this. The, the, the comment you made about um, what patients ask you. So I, I just did a keyword volume search for foot corns. Yes. And it, it's massive. This is just in Australia. There's almost 30,000 searches a month for that keyword. But the problem is, if you so so if you were to do a blog post on corns on the foot, the problem is you're competing with the Mayo Clinic, Healthline, Medical News Today, WebMD. Mm -hmm. um, so I just did a simple search for, and this is what patients ask you, do corns have roots? Yeah. Uh, there are 40 searches a month in Australia for that. Yeah. that that's what you do your blog post on because you're going to be able to compete with that for that. Yeah, yeah. You're or not you know, be able what? To compete with WebMD for foot corns, but you're going to be able to compete for do corns have roots because that's what people are looking for. And it's that comment you made. This is what pa questions about patients ask you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I must admit, I um, it's reassuring to hear that because I started writing a few blogs based on discussions I found myself having regularly, sometimes mm. multiple times daily, around the time of the barefoot running phenomena all the questions you know everyone wanted to ask your opinion what do you think about barefoot running and mm. then there's various similar questions that come up time and time again about running shoes about foot ortho so the reason i wrote blogs was being it was because i was bit, i was lazy i thought i can write this once uh, or i can say it a thousand a million times so i write it once and every time someone asks me i say to them give me your email address i'll pop i'll pop a link mm. to you so you can have a you can have a read of my thoughts so it was almost like Instead of having handouts on things, I just put put it online, and then I found a bit, bit weirdly that people would come in having read before having met me. They would come in for an initial consult having read the blog, mm. and they'd be like, "Oh, I know I'm not allowed to." These are these are patients. Accountants say to me, "I know I'm not allowed to say the word overpronation in front of you because you don't like it." And I was like, "Oh, that's kind of cool that I, you know, we already don't have to have the same boring conversations I'm having." Mm. So uh, I, I use blogs because I'm lazy. I don't know if that's the um, <laughs> technical, technically the right way to do it. Where do newsletters come into this, uh, Nina? Because I mean, what? Well, maybe perhaps we should go back a step. What, what, what's, what's the benefit? Should we all be doing newsletters? And if so, what, what are the benefits of, of doing newsletters? Because I know that some people do them, and I know that nowadays you often have to ask people for their email address yeah. um, to, to get them. And that was kind of the idea, wasn't it, to get a, a database? And then uh, I'm not sure where of GDPR, this sort of data you know, regulation mm -hmm. thing in the UK. P people are more mindful about handing over their email addresses now a newsletter still um a newsletter still a thing yeah yeah they're very much a thing i'd say probably 80 percent of my clients do regular newsletters um some of them do them every quarter some of them do them on a monthly basis um, the ones that do them on a monthly basis usually run events so um every month they'll give a talk or they'll you know they'll be off there'll be something that's quite um you know that, that there's an event or a date um and they will be you know encouraging people to rsvp and to come along um, and so I guess newsletters is a way of reaching your direct kind of hot market, right? You're not just putting something into an ad and hoping that it reaches the right people. You've got a database of people that, that you've already seen, that you've already built a relationship with. And so the actual percentage of people that will uptake um, kind of the, the information that you're putting out, whether your goal of your newsletter is to have them read something. So say you've just published a new blog. Um, it's about... Say we're at the start of the ski season, say your blog is about, you know, um, helping prevent ski injuries this season, then you're, you know, you're kind of getting that useful information out to people, but you're also keeping your clinic, um, you know, at the, at the back of their mind um, so that, you know, you're, you, again, it's, it's building that relationship and building that trust for a lot of practitioners. So, you're, you know, you're, you're staying, you're communicating with them, you know, they're not, they're not forgetting about you. For a lot of people, it's it's useful information that they can then be like, okay, cool, like they've they've just added value for me. Um, then you can use it to to do what my clients do and and share their events. Um, 
a lot of people will, will send a newsletter, even other things in the clinic. But clinics change locations. Clinics, you know, shut down for time for periods of time. It's it's easy to get that information out to, to patients as easily as possible, especially when when they they're you know gonna gonna book an appointment. So um, I'd say yeah, a hundred percent newsletters are still very much a thing. Um, and yeah, it, it's it's really the information. Like if if you don't have anything pressing to kind of share um then maybe it's a little bit you know it, it's not as um appropriate for you at, at certain times like if if you've committed to a newsletter every month but you really don't have too much to say that month then don't um you you know the the, the worst thing you can do is is send an email out to, to a mass amount of people that has nothing valuable that's the, the things i shared at the start you know that, that it's it's genuine it's clear it's you know precise information um and then yeah a great opportunity to link to all your landing pages that you've created or or share new things but yeah don't do it if you don't have anything like that that you want to share never do any content for the sake of, of just doing it um and, and definitely the same with newsletters um but then every once in a while um i've had a clinic that just wants to send out like a little like thank you it's usually like before before a break, and they just want to send a lovely like email thank you out to their clients. Just a just a like n nothing nothing about sales. Not trying to sell them anything. They're not trying to make them read anything. They just want to say, hey, like we've had a we've had a great year. You know, thank you so much for being part of the journey. Um, and those are always so well received because I I see all the replies to those, and and they're really brilliant and. And um, I think if, you, if you're a clinic that has close relationships with your, with your patients, and, and that, that's great. So uh, It's interesting that that's still so valuable and, and used because, to my mind, you could do all of that stuff on social media, I guess, couldn't you? You could, if people follow you on, on your social media channels, mm. um, you, could, you could keep them in the loop regularly. I mean, I guess a, a Twitter post or a Facebook post is a bit like a little mini mini newsletter in my mind so it's mm. i guess it's kind of it's kind of interesting that um they're still so valuable I, it's not something i do you see and, and yeah. um, because i'm so active on social media i feel like that's kind of making it okay but i might, might maybe need to need to revisit that stuff um can we I talk on, like, on, oh, sorry. no no go on sorry go on. i was gonna say that um i think like in this day and age uh, the only thing about like facebook is that anyone can pay to get into your facebook feed right like i yeah. i go through and I, like hide so many ads every day and it's like oh um whereas your I, I feel like your email inbox is just that little bit more it's a little bit more personal a little bit more important like you, you know it's so easy to scroll past a post um, especially, you know, if you're, uh, I don't know, if, if, you, if it just comes up at the wrong time and you're actually, you know, chatting to someone or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's that little, it's that little bit extra. And, and I feel, I like, I, I don't know about you, but when I was practicing, we implemented like a number of techniques for patient retention that included everything from like, like thank you newsletters to thank you cards and, um, you know, like, thank you, like, letters or kind of, like, handwrite something or, you know, handwrite it on a little card or, and all that. And, and I think that it just has a little bit more of that, like, personal kind of thought factor than, than social media, in, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I think that's valid. And to be honest, you put a post on social media and with the algorithms now, you don't know who's seeing it and yeah. who's not anyway, I guess, do you? Exactly. Um, I want to come on to the rules and regulations in a second, but while we've mentioned social media, let's just quickly go there. I mean, we won't go into it in too much depth um, just because we, uh, time and because we, uh, if, if, if social media is something you want to know more about uh, back to episode 13, where we, we did a bit of a deep dive on it, but I've spoken to quite a few people recently who um, were a bit resistant to do the whole online thing initially, but, but over time, I mean, I, I don't know anyone now of any background of any, of any specialism, uh, you know, of any, whatever age they were when they came into podiatry that doesn't mm. have a, have, have a website. Everyone has one now. You know, go back 15 years and maybe, you know, only half of podiatry said, almost everyone has one now. They know the value that you need that presence. It's the modern day, what we would call yellow pages in the, yes. in the, in the, in, in the, in the UK, you probably call it that. Um, so everyone's gone down the website route and mm -hmm. that's fine. But, but there's still, when it comes to social media, that little bit of resistance from people like, well, I've got the website, I've done the website, but I'm not doing social media. I don't get social media. I feel, whatever it may be. Um, what, what's your, your take on, on how, uh, I think I, I asked a similar question to a previous guest on a previous episode. How much is someone handicapping themselves? 
um, in the marketplace by not having social media? Can you get by on just a good website with good content or, or is it not enough anymore? Um, I think that, so I think when people are, are not willing or hesitant to uptake social media, it's because they don't perceive a genuine return on investment on the time that they, they invest into creating that social media page and maintaining it. Um, so for social media, the, these days, like if you don't have a Facebook page right now and you're starting it from scratch, um, it is very much a paid game. Whereas it used to be so easy to grow a page for free, now it's very much like you've got to you've got to pay to play, really. Um, and I guess you, if you think about what Facebook offers you, so people on Facebook and social media generally for crazy, crazy amounts of time in a day. So if you say, "All right, I I I treat a lot of kids. Um, I want to get more kids into the clinic." How am I going to reach those people? So you could go down the route of Google ads, right? So you're, what you're relying is you're relying for people to put in search terms that are relevant to the landing page that you've put up. You could do it on social or you could do it on social media. So social media, you can create an ad. So you've got to create your, your clinic page and, and everything first but you are actually able to reach a, a different set of people because the people that you can reach, you're not relying on them to be searching for something to, to get directed to you. So you can say, you can put an ad up and um, of course you've got to apply, you've got to abide by all the, all the guidelines about what ads can and can't do, but you are able to target, say you want to target new parents you want to target, you know, parents of five to 10 year olds. You want them to, you want to target women. You want to target people between a certain age. You want to target people at a certain like education level. You target people by location. You can target people by their behavior. So you can target people that are a lot more likely to engage in online shopping. So in, in purchase behavior, they're not. And then your ad um, can well does it gets shown to a whole lot more people that you may not have otherwise reached now if, if it's your first run of it it can be a fairly expensive venture and that you're still kind of you know if you're doing it yourself you're still figuring out kind of what you need to put in there and what you need to tweak but Facebook is great in the sense that it lets you beta test it. So you can run kind of the same content with different images or videos or, you know, the same, uh, the same images with different content to see what's more, more attractive to people. And then you, you kind of stick with the winning result. But it, I guess the, the benefit of it is it allows you to reach a lot more people. So I'd say that if you are a, you know, if you've never had social media and you're like a really long, uh, you know, a really long-term established clinic and your books are full, you're doing super well, you have no interest in, in social media, but you also um, don't really need it for that purpose, then that's fine. Like you have other, other ways of communicating with your patients um, and you, you're not looking to kind of get new patients to grow. Um, so you don't need to kind of invest that money into it. And, and to be honest, like I think that's fine. Um, and then there are people that are wanting to use it as a way of growing the business, um, getting more patients, targeting specific people. Um, and for those people, it is a really good tool. Like as with anything, there's a cost investment into it and a time investment into it. Um, but I, I think as long as, as you kind of optimize it and get it to a stage where it's making you a lot more money in, in patient bookings than it is in, in the cost, then, then, yeah, that's definitely very viable. Cool. So conscious of the time and, and definitely a topic I wanted to touch on because um, although the answers you give are going to be Australia specific, yes. I know we were talking briefly just before we went live and there's definitely some stuff you, you said to me that I was not aware of and, and, and um, it'd be really interesting, I think, to make everyone aware of it, whether they're in Australia, UK or otherwise. And also interesting from us in the UK to, to know whether this is the way things may go for us. And that is mm -hmm. with regards to um, not, um, not falling foul of our professional bodies, you know, staying in line with the, 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 gov the governmental or the professional body guidelines and regulations and things. And the general policy, I know we had, when we had Jill Woods on before in episode 13, I, mean, I never forget that she said, 
uh, I basically my, my my moral compass is that if I wouldn't say it to my granny, then I'm mm. not going to say it. I'm not going to say it to someone else. You know, I'm talking about kind of interactions on social media here. Um, my philosophy is uh, try not to be a dick, which I, I definitely get wrong on occasion. <laughs> but, but I've always in my mind thought that we're going to fall foul of rules, regulations on, on social media when we end up in discussions, debates, heated arguments. But really interesting, obviously, getting your take on that you can actually fall foul of, of the law on your website as well. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, so let's just talk about content and everything yeah. that we talked about, you know, co- you know, content, all, all of our, our digital footprint that we've left on, on the internet and the internet is forever as we know. Could you give us some guidelines on in Australia the, yeah. the, 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 the rules that people may not be aware of that they should be really mindful that could get them in a bit, bit of bother? Yeah, I'll, I'll sum it up in that uh, if you are doing anything, that may in like unduly in, influence someone, um, a health consumer to uptake your services or um, like in any way, however little that is, then it will likely breach the law. So um, there are, so I have written about this on my website and in Australia we're governed by both the national law um, and the uh, Pro which our kind of govern, governing body, uh, the, the advertising guidelines. Um, and here, yeah, bring that up. Um, and basically, um, I, I went, ended up reading kind of through everything and there, there's a lot, there's a lot. So I'll, I'll give you some specific examples, but, um, Leah, if you want all of them, please, please read through that. But there are kind of six main categories that are identified there. Um, and that is, uh, being misleading or deceptive in any way. Uh, using testimonials, um, uh, not complying with rules of gifts and discounts, um, giving any unreasonable expectation of beneficial treatments, um, encouraging someone to unnecessarily utilize health service and having professional endorsements. So like things that you probably won't know that you might already be doing wrong. It's everything from say i saw actually i saw a a dental ad yesterday on on social media and it was talking about it was like a limited time offer and it was like right 12 spots left so you actually can't do that because when you create a limited time offer or you say there's only 12 spots left you might feel someone might feel pressured to uptake that service you can't do that um Yeah, yeah. Uh, so testimonials is a big one here in Australia. There have been a lot of um, practitioners of, of all kind of sorts um, that are being asked to take down their testimonials. So it doesn't matter whether if, if genuinely a patient has gone on to your Google reviews or on your Facebook and added a testimonial there saying, hey, podiatrist X really helped me with my heel pain. Um, you can't do that because that might give someone else an uh, unreasonable expectation of what they can achieve by using your services. So technically in Australia here, the only kind of testimonials you're able to use are ones that say, hey, look, they, they're really professional, they're friendly, they're wheelchair accessible, they have great facilities, you know, just really nothing that might say to someone else that they might get a certain result or it might be beneficial to them. Um, I actually do. I'll, I'm going to read through this just because there's literally so many, but, um, if anyone wants this, I have a free downloadable PDF of like a quick checklist. Um, and that's just through my website as well. Um, and that just helps you. It, it, I think it just more than anything gives you a lot of things to consider, um, that you can look to your website and be like, huh, okay. Um, and can we, can we pop a link to that PDF? Um, I've already on, linked on the video. Oh, I've, already linked, I've already linked to that page I just showed before. Um, actually, Lovely. James has just made a comment. He's busy taking his website down now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, but even <laughs> it's it's even like little things like and and I know that um that it's definitely things that pop into my mind. So say um you know a lot of podiatrists these days are doing laser treatment. Um, so say if you're you know if you make any kind of inference that having a fungal nail infection might be like embarrassing or, you know, that like you can't do that because you can't make any person feel bad about themselves. Um, which I, 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 I swear almost everyone with a, with a antifungal laser, you will use the word kind of embarrassing or something to do with like unsightly fungal nail infections. You're actually in Australia not meant to, not meant to do that. Wow. 
Okay, j- just you on guys that, are, you guys are so you guys are so strict <laughs> over there. Yeah, well, I, I actually would suggest those outside of Australia actually head to Nina's page and <laughs> look at that PDF. But just on on that, we we had this case in May, in which a company was fined thirty thousand dollars for their advertising as a podiatry clinic um, and eight eight thousand dollars of costs. But what they were, uh, yeah, the, yeah the. It is alleged that the advertising claims on the running clinics, websites, and Facebook account contained false, misleading, and deceptive claims about podiatry services that were likely to create an unreasonable expectation of beneficial treatment. And that's what you were talking about, Nina. And I have, I'm aware of some of the claims they made, and they weren't actually that bad but under, they did breach the law. I mean, I, oh, I, oh. And, and a lot of people would look at this and say, you've got to be kidding, but this was $30,000 and that's exactly what we're up against um, here. So I do actually recommend people outside Australia actually do have a read of what, what the, what, and I, I mean, I, most days I come across podiatry websites that are in breach of these laws. I, I, yeah. I, um, one yesterday on offering a discount for the initial consultation. Um, it's just so common. Yeah. Uh, with, with the discounts, um, I think that if there is any kind of offer, there are, like you are, if, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, you can have offers, but you, your terms and conditions have to be really, really specific. So everything has to link to a terms and conditions sections. And your terms and conditions have to be really precise on that um, uh, in terms of kind of if, if there's a if there's a discount, I think it has to be like a monetary value that has to be like quite specific, and you can't phrase your discount in a way that uh, encourages unreasonable use. So it can't kind of encourage people to uptake the service just because kind of it's a discount. It, it yeah, it, it gets quite tricky. Yeah. But yeah. Well, I just I just yeah. I mean, when you hear of things like testimonials and people in the yeah. UK use testimonials an awful lot, and um, yeah, it's really interesting. I, I'm, I know we have our own guidelines that are dictated by HCPC and things, um, but I'm not aware that they don't let us. I'm not aware of, of them being that, that that stringent. But maybe I should maybe I should go and check. Craig, is there? I'm conscious we've just hit the hour, and I know you get tetchy. Yeah, no. is, is there anything anything no, on the no, Facebook No questions. I, I, I no. know there's no questions, but I think people are probably like you and me, and we've been taking notes about things we've got to now go <laughs> <up> to do. <laughs> um, Scribbling down. Things, you've just, uh, things we yeah. need to go and check, which is sort of... Um, so that would be a good note to finish on. But what before we finish, let me just... Hang on. I just want to bring up... Sorry, just bring up Nina's website for those who um, uh, well, joined us late and didn't catch the start. And of course, these I've linked to these advertising and marketing guidelines for people. And obviously here's um, Nina's, whoops, hang on, there's Nina's web uh, Facebook page for anyone that wants to connect. So um, for those of you who have joined late, come back in 15 minutes the video should be there it will be up on youtube later today and the podcast version will be up later today as well so thanks so much nina and thanks so much for pulling in at the last minute (laughs) thanks nina